Olá, muito boa noite. Sejam bem-vindos ao canal do BTG Pactual Digital. No YouTube estamos começando mais uma live da série BTG Atualidades e hoje o tema é como obter retornos acima da média. Para conversar com a gente nessa noite, temos dois especialistas do mercado internacional, Ralph Davidson, Portfolio Manager aqui do BTG Pactual e também o Avery, Portfolio Manager da 91. Ralph and Avery, thank you very much for joining us in this night. And Ralph, I let the word with you to start our meeting. A thrilled to be here this evening with Avery Pretorius, who's the portfolio manager or the alternate portfolio manager on 91 Asset Management's global franchise strategy. Now, we've just added this uh, fund to our, to our platform, and we think it's an excellent fund uh, that invests in global equities. And I think one of the really distinguishing characteristics about this fund is how it's been able to navigate uh, different, uh, I, I guess, founders across global equity markets. And, and you know, I, I often get questions from so many people about, you know, where are we in this market cycle? Are we too high? You know, what's going to happen? And I think that this is really not only a fund that, that will, you know, allow for global diversification, but also to do it in a really smart way with a history of, um, uh, of managing volatility uh, through difficult times. Now, now Avery, been with the strategy since its inception. Uh, can you tell us, uh, let's start with maybe, you know, what types of companies that you're looking for to add to the portfolio? And, and let's start there. Hello, Rolf. Uh, very good to be with you here today and thanking Thank you for making the time um, to see me. And so when you think about the global franchise strategy and the type of businesses we typically invest in, we invest in high quality businesses or that we would typically define as a high quality company. Now, quality company is almost like value and growth in, in, in some extent, where the definition of that can sometimes be a little bit vague. So I think it might be worthwhile just to spend some time and thinking about what do we think is a good and high quality business. But I'm sure we'll talk more about that later on. But the main aim of the strategy is really to deliver high and consistent returns to our shareholders. Um, we try to invest in an absolute return mindset. And so in that sense, we would typically do fairly, we will participate in strong markets like we've done last year. But really when we come into our own, is in volatile sideways markets or when we've had a very difficult period like the first quarter um, of last year. Great. Let, let's go back to that quality company uh, definition. And, and, and what are you guys looking for? Is that quantitative? Is that qualitative? Is that a combination of both? What, what is really a quality company? That's a very good question. So if you think about ultimately what makes a good business. It is really a, a business that can earn a return that's higher than the cost of that return or the cost of the funding. And so we're looking for businesses that can create shareholder wealth at a consistent manner over time. Now, as we all know and that we've learned in textbooks, there's typically businesses that's got a high return on capital or that's very profitable they would typically mean revert. Um, and so typically these businesses, once they're very profitable, someone will come in and potentially or more, more than likely disrupt that profitability and the returns would, would mean revert over time. And actually, if we, we've done a study going back to the 80s, actually looking at what is the probability or how persistent are returns, let's say, over a six-year holding period. And what we have found is typically the best businesses in the market, they would typically have about a 17% excess return in year one. But over a six year holding period, you typically get a fade or your returns get competed away by about a percentage here. So clearly, even the base businesses out there um, face extreme competition. The second thing we look at is actually return on capital and not return on equity. And the reason for that is we actually want to incorporate all sources of capital 
a company use actually to fund their businesses. And so we're looking at both the equity and the debt component of that. And so when you combine that and thinking of businesses that can persistent or that can generate persistently high return on capital, um, you would very quickly identify or realize that there's not a lot of companies that can actually actually do that. And it's typically businesses that we have found is those companies where the primary source of that advantage sits in a intangible asset. So think here of patents and distribution networks or something unique that this company has got that's just extremely difficult for a competitor to come and replicate. So you contrast that almost to a tangible asset like a machinery. If you make a very strong return out of that, it just really invites competition and it's typically very easy to get competed away. And so we think that the market typically underestimate the durability of that the returns um, of companies got very strong intangible assets. Great. And, and can you give me some examples uh, of companies that you maybe included in your portfolio versus companies maybe that you've recently sold? Just so we can yeah, you know, put think, those metrics to the test. Yes, I think one of those businesses that's actually stayed, stood the test of time and it's really almost a poster child and one of the key value creators for our strategy over the last 14 years is actually a business called Microsoft. And so while Microsoft on its tin might still look like, oh, well, we know Microsoft pretty well. If you actually look at the history of the company, really what's making and what's the DNA of our process is our focus on capital allocation and really understanding how the management team is able to nurture that business and, and their ability to fend off competition. So if you look, for example, at Microsoft back in, 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 in the early 2000s um, or in the mid 2000s even, I mean, it was essentially a desktop business that had a perpetual license type of business and, and, and dominated by Microsoft Office and Windows. Uh, every second person that would use a Microsoft Office and Windows would actually get it because it's for free, because they get the disk from a friend and they would just install it. Um, they would actually only upgrade about every six years. And the business really struggled to grow during that point in time. I still a very dominant business. So highly cash generative, but not really growing that strongly. What's actually happened during the last couple of years, um, and this is as a result of the internet and really innovation that's occurred in the marketplace, is the business has transitioned into a, a subscription business model and a cloud business. So there's be basically been two drivers that changed the Microsoft business. And because they went from a to a subscription business away from just someone where I pay you a disk for a disk every six years, that ensures that basically you can't pirate the business or the product anymore. So all of a sudden, their actual monetization increased by about 50%. The second thing is now all of a sudden they're delivering the product no longer through a retail distribution, but through the internet. It ensures now that the product is up to date all the time. And also they can actually give you a lot more products and services. And so the actual value that's been created through this process has been substantial and you can see that in the share price, but also in the growth of the actual company. And today, actually it's now more the cloud products and productivity tools that's the majority of Microsoft and no longer um, the windows that used to dominate the company. And so that's just at a high level to help you understand it is not only we're looking for highly profitable businesses that dominate, but actually companies that can allocate company capital efficiently to become actually even more profitable and grow pretty rapidly. Now, I'm a little bit naive when I look at, at, at Microsoft. I look at it sort of in the Steve Ballmer era, and he was the previous CEO, and it, yes. it seemed like, like you said, there wasn't a lot of value creation. 
during that period. And then we, we moved on to Satya Nardella, who there's been a ton of value creation. I, I know that you look at quality companies and you're looking at cash flows. Do you, are you thinking about management or is the quality just a byproduct of management? You're not really evaluating management up front or the decisions that lead to your cash flows, you know, sort of through management, but it's not a, a direct evaluation of management. No, I think the two are clearly very strongly interrelated. Um, so you can have the best business in the world, but as you highlighted rightly there, if you don't have the right strategy and strong capital allocation backing that, you can destroy a company. I mean, look at Nokia or BlackBerry that used to dominate the market. Um, I was actually looking at it earlier um, when we actually started the fund, um, Nokia had a market cap bigger than Apple in 2007. Uh, I don't know how many of you still remember Nokia. We pro probably everyone on this call probably had a Nokia or a BlackBerry phone. And that was the year when Apple actually launched the iPhone and looked at what happened to Apple in the business. And that just shows, again, maybe using a different example, the importance of a management team to have a vision and to really almost disrupt their own business to, to accelerate and move forward. And this is exactly what Sasha Nadella did at Microsoft. It really realized that the true competitive advantage for them is the install base in small and medium businesses. And they should not go and operate in hardware. Um, remember, they actually owned Nokia at one point in time. Um, and so they sold that and they focused on what is truly their advantage, which is from a position of strength, integrate all their products and supply productivity tools and help every single business in the world digitize. And so when you look at what Office is today, Office is no longer just focused on the, the knowledge worker, which is essentially you and me, um, which is about 250 million users. Um, it is now focused on all employees. And so all of a sudden you go from a business that's now focused on 3 billion people is actually the addressable market. And it's not just a fact where you upgrade every six years, you actually pay them now a fee per month per user. And so for them actually to make that transition and to have that visionary, you clearly had to invest behind it to see the opportunity. So we spent quite a lot of time with the management teams um, to really understand their strategy. And when we go sit down with the, with, with the management team, it's not about next quarter's earnings. It's really trying to understand the sustainability and the growth of their cash flow and how much they need to spend and actually to do that. So the best companies is almost those that's already very profitable that can, that can become even more profitable and grow faster um, over time. And so we do everything we need to do to understand the sustainability of that cash flow going forward. Now, now I'm going to backtrack for a second and go back to your definition of quality because I felt like I heard a lot of things in there that reminded me of Warren Buffett, return on invested capital, cash flow, maybe competitive advantage, um, maybe having those intangible assets, uh, you know, and I know, you know, yes. whether, you know, when, when I started following Warren Buffett, you know, one of his big investments back in that time had a huge, what I learned when, when I learned finance, what they talked about as an intangible asset, and that was Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola had the formula that they kept in some magical safe and the brand. I, I, I don't know if anybody else remembers when Coca-Cola expanded into clothing and, and watches and different things to try to, to leverage its brand. But, uh, you know, what we've seen from, from uh, Warren Buffett is he's transitioned his portfolio from Coca-Cola to Apple. Now, has, you know, has your portfolio evolved over time as your sort of considerations about quality and franchise um, evolved? Or is it, you know, I mean, I look at Coca-Cola again, it's a staples company, incredible uh, intangible asset, high cash flows, a great franchise, uh, you know, and, and, but I also, now he's in Apple, a uh, subscription business like Microsoft is, is so, 
Yes, yes. No, I think that's a that is a very valid point. If you look at almost the, at the period since we've started the strategy back in 2007, how much the world has actually evolved. Um, we actually evolved with that as there's so many new business models and companies that started out. Um, and this has really been almost a period with significant disruption and change um, as the internet evolved dramatically. And so as a result, there's a lot of new companies that's actually coming to the fore with incredibly strong business models. I mean, I mentioned earlier, Nokia was a leader when we started and Apple was still smaller. So that's just almost to give you an indication of how much the world's actually changed during this period of time. And so when you look at our history, um, we owned about similar to that, uh, just over 60% of our portfolio up until about 2010, 11 was actually dominated by the consumer and consumer staple type of companies, almost the Coca-Colas and the Pepsis. And it's businesses that sell small ticket items to us as consumers every single day. You use it without even thinking about it. Now, that type of concept is still very valid. And so the characteristics and the fundamentals that we're looking for is still there, but we find it more and more in other places in the market. So if you look at our financial characteristics of the strategy, it's still very consistent to what it's been over the whole full track record of our strategy. When I talk about return on capital or the growth or the leverage, however, we had to go and find it in other places because a lot of these consumer stable companies were actually disrupted themselves uh, because the cost of capital was so low and because they are such big businesses, they were not able to move and react quickly to the changes. And so all of a sudden you saw a lot of small brands and the key advantage historically has almost just been the power of distribution. And so with the internet, you don't need that anymore. And so that's collapsed and they had to actually rethink their strategy a little bit. And so all of a sudden the consumer staple businesses were not growing. They were focused on cutting costs as they reposition their portfolios and they increased leverage. I mean, Coca-Cola is a key example where Coca-Cola is on a net debt to EBITDA of over three times. Um, and so today, if you look at our portfolio, it's actually now about 36% of our portfolio is in technology companies, um, where back in 2011-10, it was less than 5%. And so wow. we evolved the portfolio, finding new opportunities in other places in the market, but the financial characteristics that we're looking for is still consistent. And speaking of consumer staples, I know a lot of our clients have exposure to, or at least interest in, uh, ABM Bev or Budweiser, um, uh, uh, Kraft Heinz, um, maybe even Burger King or QSR. Um, you know, are, are those companies that you guys have looked at that, uh, you know, I know they fall into the consumer staples category. Uh, and, and in fact, I think Warren Buffett's invested in those in di to different degrees. You know, are those things that you've looked at, thought about, bought, sold, own, et cetera? Yes. Yes, I mean, so if you look at our strategy and our objective is we invest in a absolute return mindset. Um, we've only got 27 stocks in our portfolio and we've got essentially want to optimize the portfolio for three things. It is first, we want to maximize it and invest in the most profitable businesses we can find globally, irrespective of where they are. We want to optimize for the fastest growing businesses that can deliver a sustainable growth rate. And we want, don't want to overpay for that. And so we want everything, right? And so it's very easy to get maybe a very cheap company. It's very easy to get a fast growing business, or it's very easy to get a highly profitable one. But to get a combination of all three is probably not that easy. And so when you look and, and you talk about some of the names you just mentioned, for example, Anheuser Bush, unfortunately, if you look at the growth rate of the company, the return on capital, the amount of leverage on their balance sheet and the risk associated to that 
relative to other opportunities we can find in the 27 names we've got in our portfolio, it just doesn't quite make the grade. We actually did own ABI historically, and it was part of those com- uh, consumer staple exposure I spoke about earlier. But that was at a time when the balance sheet was far stronger than what it is now. Remember, they, they, bought, um, and they, they bought SAB. And since the time of the purchase of SAB, they just become a little bit too big in the beer market. And so they struggle to grow volume consistently as they need to integrate quite a big business, a lot of restructuring and disruption in, 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 in the portfolio. And there's a mismatch between where the real revenue and profit is being generated and the funding cost of the leverage. And so currency keeps on being quite an important factor. And so we don't have to take that amount of risk in our portfolio. Um, and we f- they feel that we can just do much better in actually the companies that we do own. You touched on this, but I want to dig in a little bit. Valuation. You know, we found these quality companies. Um, you're looking for 27. I'm sure a lot of them. There are a lot of companies out there that might hit the the quality parameters that you're looking for, and then you go into valuation. What are you you know what metrics are you looking for? Uh, how are you how are you evaluating uh, uh, you know or comparing companies based on valuation? Uh, and then we'll get into portfolio construction. Okay, um, I think if we, we fundamentally believe that the value of a company is driven by the cash generation of the business. And so you, we don't really focus that much on earnings because management teams would typically adjust out all the bad stuff and keep on all the good stuff um, to show you a very nice PE number. So we would rather maybe spend some more time and wait for that 10Q or the 10K to come out where you can get the full financial statements and focus on and thinking about what is the actual true underlying cash flow that this business can generate um, that they've got available for future allocation? And so that cash flow that I'm referring to is typically called free cash flow. And so that is after all the operating expenses and capital expenditure um, to essentially keep the lights on. And so we take that and then we we, we, we do a forecast of what our expected expectation is of the future cash flow generation of the business. And so what our bet typically is that the business will be able to generate and continue to generate the high returns that they've generated in the past. Um, And so then we discount that to get an internal rate of return to see what the market is almost implying in the type of companies we invest in. And as I alluded to earlier, we invest in an absolute return mindset. So we would like to have a hurdle rate of high single digit, low double digit type of returns for us to be attracted to to the businesses. And so we don't want to invest in businesses where you need to get creative about the future prospects because it needs some summary or a price to sales because they don't have any earnings or they've got a poor balance sheet. Um, We want the businesses that's got very strong structural growth behind it and that you can have a lot of upside optionality of maybe some other things might might get right. So our portfolio today is actually far more profitable than the average company in the market. Um, we do have a sustainable growth rate that's higher than the market. We don't have any debt in our portfolio. In fact, we've got net cash in our portfolio. And yet we trade on a discount to the market and on a EV to EBIT which is basically you adjust, you adjust the market cap for, 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 for the balance sheet to the operating profit. And there we trade on a significant discount on a free cash flow generation basis, which actually trade in line with the market today. Wow. Um, now I have this strange vision uh, of your number 27. I have this vision where, you know, there were two people maybe, maybe in a, in a conference room and, deciding how are we going to manage this portfolio and one of them said you know i always like to do 25 stocks and the other guy probably said i always like to do 30 stocks and they ended up at 27. now 
I'm guessing that that's not the accurate story. How did you get to the number 27? Uh, you know, why is that the number? Yeah, we want to run a portfolio, a concentrated high conviction portfolio. I think if you look statistically, you would typically start losing the benefit of diversification once you move quite further behind that, uh, beyond the, the um, let's call it 30. Um, so our range has typically been about 26 to 32 type of stocks. Uh, it's not like seven is a fixed number, um, but we want to be have a high conviction portfolio. And when it comes to our team and analysts, typically when you propose an idea, it's very easy for everyone to say, well, this is a buy. And then so what we want to get some discipline in our process to say, okay, this is a buy, but what are we going to sell um, actually to to fund the actual um, idea? And what is this going to bring new in terms of a, a, a driver to the portfolio? Because it's very important for us also to have idiosyncratic, different revenue economic drivers in our portfolio. So typically when people were going to think about 27 names, they might think, oh, wow, that's quite risky. Um, given the few names that we've actually got. But I want to remember that risk is defined by drawdown in capital um, or in volatility, for example. And given that we don't have any debt in our portfolio and the quality and the sustainable earning streams that these companies generate, our risk profile is actually significantly lower than the market. And so you don't get any benefit of actually just owning a lot of other businesses. I think also as fundamental um, for, as fundamental analysts and, and managers, there's also just a limit to the amount of companies that you can know very well. And so ownership in 80 companies, for example, there's just impossible to know company number one, the same as you're gonna know company number 80. So we would rather just own 27 names that we know very, very, very well. And so we won't allocate capitals to something where we don't think we can generate a very strong absolute type of return. And, and let's and let's go into what the portfolio looks like. Are you constrained at all? You know, you said that you have a big exposure right now. Maybe in the past at one point you had a bigger exposure to consumer staples. Are you constrained by, or do you think about, gee, the index only has 20% to uh, in technology right now. We don't want to go above 30, or we don't want to go above 25. You know, or we don't want to be below 15. Is that a consideration? Are you thinking about those things, or is it just sort of listen? These are our 27 best ideas. Um, if somebody comes in with a better idea, you know, and it, it kicks out our 27th best idea. Um, it might push us into 50% technology, but but that's okay for us. How, how does that whole thing yeah. work in there? Yeah. So I think if you you raise a very, very important point. So while all 27 of our companies are really market leaders in every sense of it, and they've got all the financial characteristics we look for, it is very different to the index. And so just to give you maybe some statistics around that, out of the top 50 companies in the MECI or country index, um, 43 of those are not in our portfolio. So if you look at the top 10 companies in the MECI or country index, we only own two. And so, which is Microsoft and Johnson & Johnson. So while this is, if you look through the portfolio, it's going to be names that you know very well, but it is chosen for exactly as you and we want to invest in the 27 best ideas. However, we do have some parameters around um, risk management. And so we won't invest, for example, more than 20% of our portfolio in a certain sub-industry. And so here I'm talking about more than 20%, let's say in beverages, or more than 20% in food. Um, and that's just to ensure that there's enough diversification 
within the portfolio and enough different drivers that can actually drive turn and that could help us like a year like we've had in 2020 where actually the different drivers helped us quite a bit um, given the shocks that we've experienced during a year like that but we're not constrained by necessarily anything else in terms of we can find the best ideas and put it in our portfolio and then what's the typical turnover so okay you've got these best ideas we've got our 27 names uh, you know, is that, you know, am I going to sort of six months from now, I'll, I'll look at a statement, I'll say, wow, that's a different 27 names? Or how, how does that, how does that look? How often do you guys change? And, and what does that, you know, what does that look like on a sort of turnover basis? Yes. So maybe just to finish on the previous one, our top 10 of our companies would typically be um, just over 50% of the portfolio. Um, so it's not like we'll take significant conviction and say 20% of the portfolio will be in one name. And so there is a diversification in the names as well to ensure that there's different drivers. Um, I think if, in terms of your question, um, can you maybe just repeat the question? I just lost my train of thought. I, 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 oh, no problem. I was talking about portfolio turnover. And whether you know the, okay. those top ten yes. names that represent fifty percent of the portfolio is it going to be a new top ten names? Oh, happy Christmas! Here, here are new ten oh. names, um, or is it something different it. than that? Yeah, no, I think so. Our turnover is typically around ten percent um, year, and so that would imply about a five to seven year type of holding period um, for a typical investment idea. If you think about our strategy, it's about Investing in high return capital business. The reason why we focus so much on high return on capital is if a company has got, let's say, 20 million capital and they raise the 100% of their cash flow back into the business at 20% return on capital, that's the return that you as a shareholder are going to get. And so for you to benefit from that powerful company, owner for life actually is just going to trade the market in terms of volatility and the share price is on the base because the only way that's driving share is actually allowing fundamentals and growth of the company so that's why we focus on sustainability of return on capital and how they can actually reverse that to continue maintaining that growth so our turnover, this is probably going to be the closest to private equity you're probably going to get in a, in a public market um, or a, a type of fund structure. I, I want to talk now about risk management. It's something that you've touched on, but there's. I just wanted to clarify one thing. You keep saying, or you've said a couple of times, that you don't have any... Uh, debt in your portfolio does that mean that the companies that you guys are holding on a net basis if we were to take all the balance sheets and add them up they would debt or are you talking about there's no leverage in the portfolio itself i just want to clarify that uh, yes um both um so okay. we this is a plain vanilla strategy we don't use any derivatives or leverage or anything this is 27 stocks um, handpicked by our team that's based in three locations. So we've got a, quite a big platform of analysts that's based here in New York with me. We've got a team in Europe uh, and also down in Africa and South Africa focused on some of more emerging market companies. But so we as a team select basically 27 of the best I can find. Um, and so we don't use any structures around that. And then secondly, when you think about, we do aggregate the financials of the businesses we own, almost to look at what does the global franchise incorporated look like? And so essentially the business you're owning. And I think that's quite an important metric for us to look at, not only today, but also over time to really understand how this, the, the, the global franchise company is evolving. And when I talk about the leach, it's basically the net debt to operating profit of all the companies that we own on an aggregated basis as on a net cash position. 
And so the wow. average credit rating of our portfolio balance sheet protecting it is not great. Um, we are the two only um, AAA rated um, entities in the world, which is Microsoft and Johnson and Johnson. That's the only two that's left. Um, but just gives that gives you a sense, and just in terms of the the strength of the businesses and the cash flow that's underlying this this portfolio, and that's that's the main reason when you see significant drawdowns in markets like that in the first quarter of last year, why we would show significant less drawdown and protection of capital. Because during times of stress, it's all about liquidity. It doesn't matter about the valuation or anything else. It's, is this business going to survive? And if you've got a strong balance sheet and you can manage through that, uh, not only survive, but actually invest and lean in on investments, you're going to come out as a stronger business on the other side. And we've seen that quite quite strongly in the market environment in 2020. So is, is, is basically thinking about quality businesses, thinking about the balance sheets, thinking about the cash flow characteristics of the business, and then layering on top of that some diversification so that like you said, we're not going to be, you know, more than a certain percentage in restaurants. We're not going to be a, more than a certain percentage, be a certain more than a certain percentage in uh, con traditional consumer staples. Are those the two most significant risk management uh, functions that you guys implement, or does it go beyond that? Other investment risk or risk management that we view. Um, that's quite different for us is valuation. I think we're very cognizant in terms of understanding what's the value of the asset and having the discipline to not overpay for it. And so I think if you combine a strong balance sheet with diversified revenue streams and drivers, in addition to a valuation discipline where you're not going to overpay for the asset, that's a pretty strong um, trifecta that you can apply. And, and you mentioned a little bit that, that you guys were able to navigate uh, 2020. Um, you know, I, I know that the portfolio has been around uh, almost for 14, 15 years now. So you've seen your share of uh, volatile periods. Can you talk to us about how the portfolio did last year during the drawdown period? And then again, you know, maybe in some of the prior periods of volatility, did the, the portfolio, um, have you seen differences? Uh, and, and we'll get into broader performance in a second. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, that's, that brings us almost back to what we've discussed about a little bit earlier, is while we've actually moved the portfolio um, into different areas of the market over the last 14 years, the financial characteristics are still the same. So a lot of people actually before 2020 might have looked at our portfolio. You see a lot of technology. You see how we owned a lot of consumer staples in the 2009 11 period. So surely your drawdown characteristics are going to be a lot different because people assume technology are, are more, more a higher risk profile than let's say your traditional defensive companies. And given the changes in the business models, I mean, most of our companies actually have got subscription business models, um, so subscription revenue streams, net cash on the balance sheet. And we're living in a world where there's a significant structural growth and everything is being devised. Our footprint in terms of our performance footprint is in every single drawdown or difficult period been the same. And maybe just to put some numbers behind this, um, you can almost t look at 2020 in, in three different buckets. Um, I think the first period of, of 2020 um, was, let's call it, between the same and market bottom. We experienced the whole country actually declined about 26%, 26.1% during that, during that period. We declined by 17, just over 17. And the main reason behind it is because of those businesses like the Nestle's and the Johnson & Johnson's 
and a highly defined set for a Roche, which is a city company, and very defined rocks with high um, strong sheets to protect them. Then a, a second area of our portfolio that actually helped us during that recovery phase, um, and that is basically between March and August, when the market realized, well, um, we, we're going to survive. There's been liquidity injected. The Fed is saving us, and we're going to get to the side. Companies are very well for us during that period was actually the business. If you think of value a company, the majority of the value of a business actually sits in year three and beyond in their cash flows um, and not in year one. So as long as you've got confidence that this business won't be disrupted or might, might even be stronger on the other side, they actually came back pretty quickly um, and they because they invested behind this as well. A company actually done on that recovery was a company like Visa. Visa has got a significant cross-border business. Um, they exposed to travel, but they did pretty well in that recovery as people actually realized, well, online and digital, uh, they're actually more profitable than in a physical environment. I think the period when we struggled a little bit was almost since, let's call it, middle October, uh, when they, when Pfizer came out with the vaccine. And since then, almost a very deep value, low quality, highly cyclical, highly leveraged businesses did extremely well. And so today I was living in a world where the higher quality you are, the stronger your balance sheet and your structural growth, the cheaper you are, and almost the higher risk you've got, the more hope you promise and the more concept stock it is, like a Tesla maybe or a GameStop or all of those, the, the higher the valuation. And so if you if you take 2020 in combination for the whole year, um, we actually slightly on the market during that, that period with a very, very strong performance footprint of protecting capital in the downturn and then participating participating in the app. So if you look at our over the last 14 years, it's typically been over 12 months. If the market is up more than 12%, oh, sorry, more than percent over a 12-month period, the market is typically up about 193 We would participate and make you money, but we're probably going to lag in that environment. Beta of the portfolio is 0.75. We've got significantly less volatility in the market. When we do typically very well, as in that sideways market or what we call, let's say, between 0 or 10% or down, that's when we typically outperform. And it's the combination of that that will outperform over a full cycle. Great, thank you very much. I, I think um, a, a couple of things that I heard in there that I almost want to reiterate, which was, uh, you know, I think you guys were down 17 versus 26 or so in, in, in the sort of January to March drawdown last year, which is really impressive. When we go back uh, through history and, and look at various volumes, um, you know, your portfolio has acted similarly or outperformed, I should say, similarly. When we go back to the inception of the portfolio, and I'm not sure you mentioned this, you guys have actually outperformed the index by about 3% a year. Uh, and that's over what, 13, 14 years. And if you sort of add all of that up, that's almost a 60% difference uh, because of compounding between your portfolio and, um, and the MSCI uh, all country world, which is your benchmark. So incredibly impressive performance there uh, through the cycle and through different periods. Um, one final thing I wanted to ask you, um, do you guys think about ESG at all, environmentally, environmental and, and, and social issues and, and sort of put a layer or a lens uh, of that on the portfolio? Yes, I think ESG, is a fully integrated part of our process. I mean, if you think about our whole investment framework and philosophy is about the sustainability of cash flows. And so if you want to sustain business going forward, you need to invest in an environmental sustainable way. You need to be very corporate 
governance and social responsibility. And so all of those characteristics are parcel of our investment process and what we do here at 91. Um, if you look at our portfolio from a carbon footprint point of view, uh, given that the, the, that our portfolio and our philosophy is focused on companies that's got very strong intangible assets, um, our carbon footprint is about 80 to 90% lower than, than the average company in the marketplace. And even if you look at our, our footprint that we've got, the 80% of our carbon emissions is actually from the scope two and three. So it actually comes more from the supply chain and distribution of the products rather from, from the company itself. And so we do spend a lot of time engaging with our companies to ensure they invest for a better tomorrow. They do it with the right social conscience and governance um, is very important in terms of understanding the diversity and how they actually manage the business. So we've always believed throughout our 13 year period, our 14 year period now almost, that you can't invest in this, you can't have sustainable returns and cash flows if you don't do it in a sustainable manner. Great. Um, I'm going to ask you the most difficult question, which is, is there a question that I haven't asked you that I should have? Is there something else that we should know about this, uh, about your process, about your team, about your performance, about the fund itself um, that we didn't cover? I feel like we covered a lot here. No, I think you've been very um, thorough in your in your questioning. Um, I can maybe just reiterate a couple of things. Uh, this is a very deep um, team of experts that's been together um, and managing this portfolio for quite some time. I mean, we've been on this portfolio since inception, which is 2007. The world's changed quite a bit over this period. Um, and so we continue to evolve the of thinking and where are we going to find the investment opportunities. Um, I think in an environment where the the overall market and index might be very expensive, um, this is probably not going to be a time for beta or just get broad, broad exposure. And so a portfolio of 27 of the best ideas we can source globally with an idea of not hoping for a better tomorrow and get some cyclical uptrade, but with strong fundamental underpinning is actually giving us a lot of comfort. And so this value rally or cyclical rally that we've experienced is actually placed a lot of our businesses on site. And so relative to the market, our portfolio is actually very attractively priced at this point in time, which makes us pretty excited um, as, active, as active majors to find very good opportunities in a market like this. Well, well, we're excited to have it on the platform as well. I think, you know, I, th I think some of the things that we look for and look at in your portfolio uh, is that strong, strong fundamental bias that you've spoken a lot about, uh, your ability to manage volatility in those downturns. I think we've all seen global equity markets uh, rally very significantly over the past year. Um, you know, with what we have, there may be further to go, However, you know, this, it's going to be a volatile ride um, and we can't be sure that uh, we, we won't see some, some future drawdowns. And I think, you know, regardless of, of what the ride looks like, certainly the returns that we've seen since last March uh, are going to moderate. And, and like you said, this is a portfolio that does very well in those moderate return environments. It's a portfolio that does very, very well in volatile environments. It's a portfolio where the characteristics are much more attractive than the market overall. And those characteristics not only range from uh, free cash flow and operating metrics, but also on the valuation side and the balance sheet side. And I think that that is a great protection. These are also, as you mentioned, global brands that, uh, that, that many of us know uh, and feel comfortable with. And, and so we're really excited to have you guys and have you on the platform. The success of the of, of the portfolio since inception, again, 202% uh, versus 143% for the index. 
turns into 8.8% uh, .8 a year, nearly 9% a year versus 5.8% versus the index. So uh, that has really been phenomenal. Uh, and I think that all of the work that you and your team are doing, uh, you know, the results are showing here. And so we're excited for this. Uh, congratulations. And I really want to thank you for your time uh, and, and, and your patience in answering all these questions. No, thank you for having me. It's been a fun conversation. Um, thank you. Thank you.